Okay. All right, so um, welcome everybody. Nice to see so many of you um, turning up for, I think this will be, this will be eighth uh, CPD session that the guys have organized now. So I think, yeah, we're on to, it must be Wednesday, so it must be the eighth and we've had some really good sessions on a range of topics. Um, we're gonna have a look at weather, predominantly about how we can teach weather, how I teach weather, um, how over the years I've developed some of the ideas that I've developed and why I've developed them. Really also interested in feedback from you guys. Huge, huge, huge amount of um, knowledge in the room here. So I know certainly in the pre quiz that we did, quite a few uh, cruising instructors, quite a few yacht master instructors. So there's a huge amount of knowledge already and quite a lot of shore based instructors in the room. Um, so I'll do a quick introduction. Who am I? I'm Kath Scott. I'm a yacht master instructor power. I'm an advanced power boat instructor and I'm also a shore based instructor. I come from sort of all three disciplines, if you like. I, I'll admit I'm not a dinghy sailor. Um, so um, me, me and dinghies don't get on so well, but yachts I'm okay on. Um, I, well, I, I joined the military from university and had the absolute privilege of going to New Zealand to learn to sail with the New Zealand Navy, um, learning to sail in North Island for three weeks in the summer. I mean, what's not to like, quite frankly. So got a little bit hooked on sailing, got a, also got into quite a lot of um, racing, some of the round the cans, but some of the offshore racing as well. Then moved into power boating. Um, and then moved into motor boating. So um, we, I have a, a 42 foot motor cruiser here. And I like to say, Yacht Master Instructor Power, so teaching all the way through up to the Yacht Master schemes. So um, from my perspective, I'm going to try and make this as relevant as I can to all schemes, because I appreciate we've got quite a background of people on here. Um, and like I say, certainly my knowledge of the dinghy scheme is really not great. So if anyone with the dinghy scheme, please feel free to correct me on that. And please don't, you know, I, I, I won't be offended at all. Okay. So what are we going to have a look at today? If I just put my screen share on for you. Okay. This is where we are going to start with today. We're going to have a look at teaching meteorology. Um, and the initial brief for this session was um, just about weather, like I say. So what did people want from a weather session from an instructor point of view? I appreciate that we've got huge different ranges of experience. So some people wanted to look at learning new things and having some tips and tricks as to how they can improve their own knowledge because I think weather is one of the things that you will never know all there is to know about it. It's a huge, huge subject. The other side of the house is also about how we're going to look at some uh, top tips for, for teaching, but also about what do our schemes really ask us to teach? I'm sure we've got an enormous amount of experience of teaching it. You know, I've lost track of the number of Yacht Master Theory sessions I've taught. And actually in the build up to this session, I went and got the book out and read what we're supposed to be teaching, not what we might be teaching. So um, there's a little bit in there, there's a little bit of a, uh, an interesting game we're gonna play a little bit later to see what do you know about what we're supposed to be teaching? So from the practical side of the schemes and also from the theory side of the schemes, because lots of people do it very differently. And I think something like weather has started to balloon a little bit, particularly if you get an instructor who is super enthusiastic about weather. And I do find myself sometimes thinking, do students really need to know this or am I just teaching them because I really think it's amazing and they should really learn it. So that's part of what we're going to have a look at today. So our uh, summary session, so the summary today, what level of weather knowledge do we need to impart to our students to ensure that they stay as safe as they possibly can, okay? Can they make good skippering decisions? Can they make good crew decisions? What do they need to know? So I think of it as um, what, do, what must they know? What should they know and what could they know? So what really must they know in order to go to sea? And we'll talk about the different levels of that because it very much depends on what kind of vessel you have, very much depends on where you're going. Are you a summertime sailor? You drop your little powerboat in and you go blast around the bay with your mates and that's all you ever do, you know, and you never go outside of land. Well, clearly that level of weather knowledge is vastly different to somebody taking the yacht um, across, down, you know, across the channel or something like that. So what, what must they know? What should they know and what could they know? The kids are always the, these are a bunch of switched on students and actually we've got a little bit of spare time so maybe we can add some extra bits and pieces in here. The, the musts are really, what can they really not leave this course without knowing? And then we're looking at the shoulds. Is there anything else that we really think they should know in order to be able to go and do what they want to do, okay? 
So what are we looking at for your objectives today then? How well do you know your weather? I hope you didn't think you were all turning up for a session where you were just going to listen to me. You're going to do some of the work as well, okay? Um, how well do you know your weather? Um, what levels of weather we need, do we need for the different RYA courses? And I'm very happy. Um, like I said, I've been in the books. I've been into the syllabus books. I've pulled out the information. Very happy to have a discussion around how correct that is or is that what we're really doing? Um, and then some top tips and tricks for getting your students to understand weather. One of the things for me as a background is I came through having done my day skipper practical sale, having moved into doing my yacht master theory way back in the day when the internet didn't really exist. And, um, and it was done by you know distance learning. You were sent a workbook, you wrote things down, you posted it back to your, your tutor. They wrote red pen all over it and sent it back to you and said, you know, two out of 10, try again. So it's incredibly difficult, I think, to learn weather from that perspective because none of the pictures really moved other than what you saw on the TV. Whereas now I think we've got such a massive range of opportunity of handheld devices that can show synoptic charts, that can show things like windy. So students really should be able to understand that moving weather picture that's not just an absolute static weather picture, okay? So just as a starter for 10, what I would like to do, I'm just gonna pop you out of the screen share there. What I would like to do is launch a poll. So hopefully you guys will have had a go at polls before in Zoom. If you haven't, there will be a box that comes up in the middle of your screen. There are two questions on there. One is how do you rate your own weather knowledge? So we can have a look at what we think as a class. And also how well do you feel that you teach weather? OK, so there'll be two questions come up. You just need to select one answer for each one. And when we've all selected, I will share the results. So hopefully you should now have a poll coming up. You're all now scowling at the screen. So I'm guessing a little box has popped up in the middle. So how do you rate your own weather knowledge then? Fantastic. Pretty good. Good. Not too good or hardly at all. Um, there's a few explanations on there. Also, how do you feel that you teach weather? Whether it's great, pretty good, good, not great. I try and avoid teaching it, it's a minefield, okay? So I give you a couple of minutes just to have a look at that. Pop end polling up. Alrighty, let me share the results with you then, okay? So first up then, how do you rate your own weather knowledge? Uh, we've got most people sitting in the middle, I suppose that's not so much of a surprise. People sitting with, um, good, I'm happy with most of the basic concepts, pretty sure I can forecast when it's going to rain. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's all about whether it rains on your washing or not. Um, and then 27%, not so great. I understand some basics up to some pretty good, okay? We look down then, how well do you feel that you teach weather? Interesting, so good is the predominant one there, 60% of you, happy that I can teach the level that I need to, okay? So that's really interesting. And I put that question in there to say, lots of us are teaching at different levels. Um, so I would always be an advocate of knowing more than your students. OK, so that's always one thing. Um, so if you are a power level two instructor, for example, it would be useful if you knew a little bit more about the weather than you expect your level two students to walk out of the door with. Um, and, and interesting that if you're feeling that you're, you're teaching to the level, what is next for you? Where else might you go with that? OK, so let me pop the results away and the poll away. Okie dokie. So if I go back to, first up then I'm gonna get you doing some thinking. Okay, so if I pop my screen share up with you, there we are. Um, how well do you know your weather? Okay, so there's a few things appearing on there. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to pop a file in the chat, which will be a PDF file. So you should all be able to read it. I'm going to pop it in the chat that you should be able to download. And then I'm going to break you out into what's probably going to be four breakout rooms. It's going to be completely random. Um, so I'm not going to select you at all. I'm just going to let the, the clever box decide who goes in which room. And I'd like you to head over into your breakout rooms for a few minutes to have a look at there are 15 questions. And on the question set, what I'd like to know is you'll see the questions aren't just can you tell me what rough sea status, for example. It's how would you describe it? So have a think about what the answer is have, about how you would describe it to a student, but also where do you think those questions fit on the actual schemes that we have? Do you think they're down at that beginner level? So that sort of power boat level two level, that helmsman level, that uh, stingy sailing one and two, I think it is, 
or are they at that more intermediate level where we've got intermediate power boat, perhaps day skipper practical, um, some more of the day sailing for dinghies, and then up at the more advanced level, coast skipper yacht master. Okay. So let me just pop the file in the chat for you. Uh, bear with me a second. Let me come off screen share there. Let me do, there we go. Um, yeah, if you've not done the breakout rooms before, you'll get a message that pops up onto your screen right now that says, go to join the breakout room. I can't make you go. You have to click join to go, okay? So um, I will pop you into the breakout rooms and see how we get on. But I'm gonna give you this 15 questions. So I reckon five minutes for 15 questions, okay? What do we think? Yeah. Maybe, maybe 10, we'll see, okay? Maybe 10, all righty. So for those of you who might be watching um, later online rather than in the live sessions, what I have just done is sent the students out into a breakout room. They've got the weather quiz that you can see on the screen. And what I've asked them to do is go through the questions and have a discussion in the groups, not just to come up with necessarily what the answers are, because it's not just a specific answer that I'm after. It's also how they would perhaps explain that to a student. So where we're looking at what does the term soon mean in a forecast, it's not just a specific, this is the answer that we're after, but how would we go about explaining it to a student, but also where do we see that that fits within the overall syllabuses from sort of beginner through to advanced? So they're busily uh, racking their brains in their various breakout rooms at the moment, and they'll be back shortly. So um, I'll leave you with the quiz there just to have a quick look at. We discussed a lot on question 15. Um, we thought it was incredibly subjective. Um, and it really depended whether or not you're going out on your lilo um, okay. <laughs> or if you're going across the Atlantic. Um, it, it was very, yeah, so we all had different opinions, I think. Okay. And also, I think it very much depends on the background. Um, I jumped into one of the breakout rooms and there was some discussion about depends what sort of boat you're in as well. Um, so it depends on really what schemes you're coming from, perhaps what your, you know, your usual boating activities are. For those of you teaching across the schemes might be slightly easier. For those of you perhaps teaching in one single scheme might be that that's the only real knowledge that you have and that's the only real knowledge that you do put into play. So, um, so how would you score yourselves? 15 out of 15? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not quite so many happy faces, a little bit, well, okay. Alrighty, we're really quickly going to go through them. Um, I'll just pop the screen shut up. And what I'm just going to ask you guys to do is just come up with some simple um, questions. But more importantly, what I want is a question around where we think we might teach this. Okay. So it's really open for any of you, you to answer it. Um, we'll do sort of something simple like the first one. So what does the term soon mean in a forecast? Okay. Um, where do we think that that fits within the schemes that we are teaching? Where would you ideally be teaching that? All schemes. All, all schemes, yeah. Where would we assume that students knew it? So where would you be, where would you first be teaching that? Power level two. Level possibly. So power level two, yeah, absolutely, something like that. Um, I mean, I would not be expecting someone to come on a Yacht Master Pratt and not know what soon meant in a forecast. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd be kind of super disappointed. Molly, go for it. Sorry, I teach a lot of children, kind of, seven and eight-year-olds, I wouldn't be expecting them to know that. I teach them dinghy sailing. Okay. So I guess the thing for me then is where does that weather knowledge come into that set of schemes, particularly if you're you're looking at some children, uh, where in the dinghy sailing scheme, if you're like a national sailing scheme, does it even start talking about weather? Um, I think when I looked at it, it was more around the day sailing activity. Um, the day sailing course, I think it is. And like I said, I'm, I'm absolutely no expert on the dinghy uh, scheme, but it's still a day sailing, I think. Um, so for me, yeah, who is going to know that? So soon, well, you know, what does the term soon mean? Go on, put us out of our misery, anyone? Uh, six to 12 hours from the issue of the forecast. Okay, and what's the really important thing in that that we're trying to get across to students? The issue of the forecast. Um, Absolutely, because otherwise you get a whole bunch of students, particularly when they're perhaps doing day skip theory or even yacht master theory, who are just blindly learning all of these definitions, and they'll go six to 12 hours. And you think, great, 
but from when okay does it is it important right now or is it going to be important um you know in a couple of hours time okay and the things that I picked on here are some of the things that I tend to focus on when I'm teaching. So rather than teaching the entire set, if you like, these are the ones I sort of I sort of, I looked at to focus on. So how do we describe moderate visibility then? What are we looking at for moderate visibility? Two to five miles visibility. Okay, two to five miles visibility. And what's going to be one of the easiest ways of teaching that? Because if we just ask students to remember numbers, it's really tough. Um, if you just say, here's a set of numbers that I want you to learn for visibility, there's another set of numbers I want you to learn for C state, you know, how can we go about making that an easier thing to teach for them? Look at the Isle of Wight and see if you can see it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So where are your, where are you teaching from? And realistically, how far away are some of the things that you are going to see? I think particularly if you're on a multi-day course, where you have the option to talk about well, yesterday we could see this but today we can't so even if it's more of a practical course where it, you know even down at power level two i could be talking about launching from port Head here if i can't see the the bridge across to wales then we're not in moderate visibility you know well we're in moderate visibility so we're not in good visibility if i can't see the bridge then i'm I, I'm, I'm reducing that visibility already so you think it's about how you can make it relevant to them. How could they look out of their window or their, their boat, wherever it is, and say, if I can see the Isle of Wight, great. If I can see that, whatever it is, and it really will depend on where you are around the country, okay? Now, interestingly, how do you describe a rough sea state? One of the big reasons I put this one in there is because everybody will tell me they have been in a rough sea. I get numerous students come to me to tell me that they have been in a rough sea. And really what they mean is they went out on somebody's boat and it was a little bit more uncomfortable than they thought. And they didn't really like it. So when we're looking at then, how are we describing a rough sea state? How are we going to do that to our students? Basically, rough. when if you're on a flybridge cruiser, you're getting wet by waves coming over. Nice. You really should have gone home. <laughs> yeah, you're taking waves over the flybridge. That's bad. <laughs> yeah, that's the whole point of having a flybridge. It's straight dry, surely. OK, so, yeah. All right. So taking waves over the flybridge. Any other thoughts? How are we going to describe a rough sea state? When you're on always, I was. Oh, sorry, mate. Go on. Go on, Bob. When you're on Choking. a windsurfer and you can't see the other board because it's one's in the trough and you're in the trough and you're separated by a wave. Okay, so yeah, if you could, if you couldn't see another vessel, Bob, you had a thought. Uh, show pictures. Yeah, you can. The only thing for me is showing pictures. I think is great to give them an idea of, of how white the top of the wave might be, or how big the wave might be. But the other thing I'm always saying to my students is, it's always bigger out there than it looks. It's That's why I, I always. Uh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, of course. Um, I, I teach mainly um, day skipper, comp crew, and day skipper, and I always make a point of saying when we're using these terms, imminent and soon, and all that sort of thing, or, or moderate and smooth and slight. On the on the average sailing boat for a day skipper level, I always say to them, be wary if it even says moderate, because mm -hmm. most of these things are made for oil tankers. And I've been in moderate, and I'm sure lots of other people are. Moderate sounds really lovely, but. Off a Gunnard point is a moderate and it actually is on the on the scale and you think I, I wouldn't want a day skipper to go out in this. So it's about highlighting that they're made for, for tankers and big ships, yeah. that, that that terminology is not not for small boats. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's a great point. And I think for me, it's also, like I said, it is that age old thing of, yeah, I've been out in a rough sea and then, you know, you start talking about wave heights up and around four metres and then you see people sort of looking up at the ceiling going, that's quite big, isn't it? Really? Mm. I'm thinking, yeah. So were you really in that? Or was it just that it was uncomfortable? So for me, the big teaching point is you're absolutely right. If it's moderate, it's already going to be uncomfortable pretty much no matter what you're in. I mean, if I'm going crashing around in a rib and I want to do rough water handling, that's great. But for anything else, it's going to be pretty miserable. And my students are probably not going to be having the best time. I would suspect because then we're into the fear factor. Then we're into the feeling sick. Then we're into the, I don't really want to do anything. So actually, whilst it is nice, I think, for students to experience something a little bit bumpier, I think there has to come that time of, you know, we don't want to have to charge out there and go, oh, look, it's really rough over there. Let's go give it a go. Um, because, again, what are we recommending to people? If it says rough in the forecast, is anyone going to recommend anyone to go to sea? Yeah. Depends what vessel. Depends what vessel you're in, really. I think if you're in a larger vessel, it's uh, not going to be nice. But uh, you might have to. You might be on a time frame.
you, you might be, you might be, but I think when we're looking at what we would reasonably go out in um, and what we would reasonably be back and recommending and come back to the people will come and do a training course with you in order to do what? So that they can either go and get some more experience or they can take their own boats out. What are we realistically looking at? You know, we say to moderate, absolutely, Alan, take your point. Moderate doesn't sound so bad, does it? Moderate sounds all right. And I take students out here all the time in moderate and they go, ooh, I'm not liking this path. You know, and I say no. So have a really good think about it. OK, um, inshore waters then. This should have been a nice, easy one. Uh, how far offshore is the inshore waters valid to? What do we come up with? Well, well. Yeah, 12 nautical miles. Um, is that going to do most of our teaching? Is that going to cover most of our teaching? Yeah. 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 What, are the, what are the only things that, that aren't going to really be covered? In? Sure, I like I teach yacht master offshore, so um, we we could easily be doing a sixty mile passage. Yeah. So we think we're into moving away from coastal sailing, not just necessarily um, coastal skipper and, and yacht master offshore, but actually looking at going across the channel, looking at going across the Irish Sea. So actually looking at going out of that boundary, if you like, around the UK. Yeah. And the vast majority of people, I would say, don't really want to do that because once you're sort of out of sight of land, it's all a little bit scarier, isn't it? So the vast majority of people who are looking at day trips are not necessarily looking at going that far offshore. So I think for me, it's the inshore waters really should be that go to um, to start with their forecast. OK, um, yeah. Wind strength at the shipping forecast area turns red. Over four, six, six mm. or over strong wind warning. For the shipping forecast? Eight, or so eight. Yeah, see there's a sneaky one in there, Julia. I'm glad I caught ah. ah, you see, sneaky, sneaky. Okay, so again, it's about shipping what can we- Shipping forecast, inshore, <laughs> right. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, yeah, gotcha. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> yeah. So when we're looking then, um, bringing out what the shipping forecast is, people will have heard of it. When they're looking at it, for me, it's about the colours. So inshore waters, we're looking at the red line going around four, six, absolutely, like Julie just said. Shipping forecast red. I'm already looking at an inshore waters. If there's red lines, I'm thinking it's not my day really to go sailing. If I want to go out pleasure cruising, clues in the title, having fun, not hanging on for dear life, going, when does this stop? Okay. So it's about getting students to look at that and go, if there is a red line around it, then your first thought should be, do I need to go? Not, we are always weather optimists, aren't we? We're always looking at it going, I'm an absolute weather optimist. It won't be that bad. I know it says that, but it doesn't really mean it. And then you go out and go, okay, really meant it. Yeah, now, now I'm not having so much fun. Okay. Um, advection fog, how is it formed and how does it dissipate? I think there's some good good discussions going on. Anyone want to pick that one up? Yeah, we, uh, we was uh, basically warm, moist air over a cold sea mm -hmm. and it will only dissipate when one of those two changes. So change in wind direction, change in tide. Um, yeah, so that, that, that was it. OK, so again, when I'm thinking about teaching fog, I'm trying to get people to think you can't have fog if you don't have something cold and something warm and moist. Yeah, thinking, getting students to think about, actually, if I have a mirror in my shower room and I open the shower room door, why does the mirror steam up? What happens when I close the door to stop it steaming up, right? Then I open the door again and what happens? It gets worse. So getting them to think about practical activities where they can start to understand fog. And um, anyone had people say, well, the fog is over the sea, therefore it is sea fog. Yeah, because I've, I've, I've certainly had, as a training assessor here on the lifeboat, now people say, but it's foggy out there, Kath, it must be sea fog because it's over the sea. I said, no, it's just, land fog that's fallen out over the sea no no no. it has to be sea fog so getting students to understand the difference between the two but what's the most important thing is how did they go away because if they understand how they're formed they can then understand how they're going to go away and say actually this is going to mean that i can go sailing later on today or i can't so actually what i need to do is go to the, the butty wagon get some bacon butties you know clean a bit of the boat and wait for later i think you know ross i think you were talking about when is a good time to go out sailing what does this mean for me going out sailing? can i go later perhaps yeah if it's radiation fog it will probably burn away okay if it's advection fog unless we've got a big significant change in one of those either the seas you know the sea the tide or the wind then yeah it's not going to go is it um this one created some fun. How do you explain coastal convergence and divergence? Now you know what it is. How do you explain it? How do you get students to understand it? Anyone want to pick that one up? 
uh, we go, mm. just uh, difference in friction as the air okay. passes over the land versus over the sea. Okay. So it's slowed down over the land. Okay, so starting students thinking that air is going to travel faster over the sea than it is over the land, and actually what is going to happen if it is moving from one to the other. Nice. And um, where do we put coastal convergence and divergence then? Where does that fit into any of the syllabuses, do you think? Where do we start bringing that in? I'd look at coastal level or above or okay. advanced pilotage, round about that kind of level. Okay. Any other thoughts? Fits in the small boat scheme in intermediate and uh, mm -hmm. regional racing. Okay. Um, dinghy sailors amongst you. Any thoughts on divergence and, and uh, convergence of divergent wind? I haven't got my teeth in today. So that is the dinghy scheme. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Matthew, Matthew, I, I didn't right. realise that. That's all sorry. right, so, uh, yeah, that's... it would also be very slightly at the top end of performance sailing. Oh, right, okay, okay. Yeah, you might get it in day sailing as well. Okay, so it's, it's an interesting one. It'd be interesting to see where we where it actually fits on the, on the syllabus for you. Um, how's a sea breeze going to affect your sailing trip? And where might we start talking about that kind of sea breeze with people? Waiting it out, yeah, no, go for it. Go on, Molly. We'd be talking about sea breezes quite early um, okay. in the in the syllabus because especially I teach down at Chichester Harbour and we can rely on a sea breeze pretty regularly in the summer. Um, and so we'd be we'd be talking about that even with our small beans, um, maybe at stage two or three even. Okay. Uh, maybe not stage two, that might be a bit early, but stage three or four, okay. um, depending on their age, quite happily. And how would you go about explaining it, particularly if oh, you're sorry. looking more at... No, but also, I'm just, it's an as, as well as, how would you go about explaining it, particularly to the younger audience? So we talk about hot air rising, um, and we, we'd normally get like a, a whiteboard out and different kind of whiteboard pens, and it'd be all very exciting. But hot air rises, and that leaves a vacuum. Um, so we talk about um, the air kind of being sucked in from the sea, um, and that creates a kind of sucking in motion um and yeah you get you get you get it going around in a sort of circle um <laughs> so that's how you get your onshore yeah nice uh, any other thoughts other than perhaps in the in the dinghy scheme where we're going to be looking at the the sea breeze so i think we said sort of power intermediate level that yeah. kind of thing day skipper practical maybe? yeah definitely day skipper practical okay is that from a sailing or a power perspective Deb? Just from a sailing okay um, and a, a typical example, one that I'm, I brought up in our discussion group is um, I had a day on a, a chap on the day skipper practical and the forecast for the day was a force three and we ended up in a force five and he struggled. He couldn't cope with it. Um, and um, in his debrief, he told me that he wouldn't have gone out in that. But of course, it was never forecast. It was because the conditions were right for that to form. Okay. Um, so it was making him understand that it isn't forecast, that you've got to yeah. look and understand the conditions that may create it. Yeah, Easily, absolutely. And you go the other way and you have no wind at all. <laughs> Which from a, a motor or a power perspective, we're liking. It's great news. <laughs> it's great news, yeah. Okie dokie. Um, now uh, this one I had to stick in there. Oh, sorry, Matthew, go on. I was just going to say, just building on what Molly said, um, when you're inland, uh, so in a, a noticeable effect at Queen Mary, which is near Heathrow Airport, is you can't teach dinghy sailing until the concrete's hot enough and it generates a sea breeze on the west side of London. So it's just interesting, interesting you can bring it in to inland people as well as to... Nice. Yeah. yeah. Or I guess also if you've got the luxury of perhaps sailing um, somewhere a little bit hotter and you know, on the, on the continent or wherever, looking for your, your fairly regular sea breeze. I think it's always when people talk about icy seas and they say, well, I hired a boat on holiday. I took the boat out at about 11-ish and it was really flat in the harbour. And then when I brought it back at about three o'clock in the afternoon, I really struggled to get it back in. It didn't say that on the weather forecast. And you think, no, funny. But yeah, so, okie dokie. Um, now I did have to put this one in for those who were sitting sort of more at the yacht master uh, levels. So catabolic winds and how it affects your sailing. So clearly we're seeing, we're doing 
particular wind effects more at that yacht master level. So yacht master theory, um, yacht master practicals. Um, what is catabatic winds and how is it going to affect our sailing? What are the things to worry about? Go for it. First one. Oh, this has got all gone quiet now. If you're sailing between two islands, I, I'm not I'm not a yacht master, just to yeah. be clear. Yeah, sure. um, but I, um, the guys in the breakout room were, were telling me all about it. Um, if you're sailing between two islands and they've got two great big volcanoes or something on them, uh, you're going to get the wind kind of funneling down mm -hmm. um, and it's going to become very strong very suddenly um, yeah. and it's it's going to be more of an issue offshore further offshore mm -hmm. um, and that is what I understand the catabatic wind to be from a complete beginner's point of view. Okay any any other thoughts on catabatic winds? Yeah, I think it's more of an issue when you're at anchor really overnight with the uh, wind okay. tumbling down the valley. Okay that's an interesting so rather than sailing along somewhere where perhaps you're going to get more hit by that catabatic wind, what's the effect that it's going to have as it does tumble down uh, to, to, to you sitting at anchor? Yeah, interesting thought. Yeah, really interesting. I, I, on that, I, I was anchored off of Sark some years ago and um, the wind was blowing from the east. So I thought, oh, I'll just get in nicely behind Sark of a nice calm night. So I was on the west side of Sark. Oh, we, we, we had to set a real good anchor watch up so that we didn't drag because the strength of the wind just coming over the saddle at Sark and, and falling down the hill, you know, it, it was probably blowing, I would guess, force four, force five, from a catabatic wind. Yeah. That wasn't nice. And I remember once in a tall ship's race, um, kind of in the fjords, where, you know, we were on an Oyster 68 and nice. it really went, oh, it was scarily went over. <laughs> You know, and that's sort of 30 tons of boat. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's also about how do you balance the fact that it's a theory session, if you like. So you're going to have to talk about these catabatic winds. How can you bring those stories into making it more real for the students? Because effectively, otherwise, you're just showing them a picture of a hill and saying, well, you know, it falls down the hill kind of thing and it'll get a bit breezy. But what is the so what for the students learning it? Are they learning it just because it's on the syllabus and they have to? or how can they really start to apply it, I think is a great one. Okay, uh, we started moving into depressions then, where might we find cumulonimbus clouds? Because quite a few of you, I think, put talking about cloud types on your, what you'd like to get out of it. So yeah, Molly's giving me a good, <laughs> a good nod on that one. So where are we gonna find cumulonimbus clouds? Cold front. <coughs> Cold front, okay. What is a cumulonimbus cloud? It's a rain carrying nimbus means rain. So I'm also thinking, and I'll, I'll show you a slide in just a second, but when we're talking about breaking it down, one of the things for me is if I'm talking about cloud types, there are only so many clouds. Types. There are actually 10 types of cloud types, okay? But we can break them down into some really simple ones. So cumulus, cumulo, big heap. Like you see when the Simpsons comes on the TV and they put the Simpsons on and there's a little, you know, like a child would draw a cloud, that kind of thing, a big heap of something. And then you're absolutely right, nimbus rain bearing. So really it's a bit like a sentence maker game. All we're doing is putting things together. What are we expecting? A lot of heaped rain bearing clouds. You're absolutely right, yeah, cold front as it comes over. Um, atmospheric <laughs> pressure change on the depression then? What are, how would we easily explain that? It drops, levels out and then rises again. Okay, so for me, I talk about a bucket. It's a bit like a bucket shape. Okay, you've got the V of the depression that comes over, but a bit like a bucket shape. And what's the so what for me? If I'm watching my barometer and I'm seeing that pressure drop, then something is changing, isn't it? If I'm watching it rise, then hopefully now we're all wet through and it's got a bit breezy. Um, you know, there might be some better, better weather on the way. And getting people to understand the link to the importance of putting it into a logbook and watching what the barometer does as well. So you think for me, yeah, thinking about it looking like it's a, a bucket shape. So it's going to get worse and then it will get better. OK, um, ha, now cirrus clouds. I popped into one of the breakout rooms. There's some interesting discussion about cirrus clouds. How are cirrus clouds formed and what might they signify? Notice I said what might they signify, not what do they signify. OK, anyone want to pick that up? Yeah, they're um, ice crystals um, and it's, it's a very high cloud and you see, you see it um, at an early stage when a, a front's going to go through. Yeah. So what are we getting the students to look for? It would have been relatively blue sky, we'd have had some nice sailing and we start to see some of those cirrus, those high level clouds, mare's tails, locks of hair. 
So thinking of, of describing them along those lines, yeah, ice crystals, why do they look streaky? Because you've got those high wind gradients aloft that are streaking those things. So getting people to understand what they are and how they're, how they're doing it. And what do they signify? Yeah, um, let's have a think about the depression that might be coming. How big or small is it? Because more, than, more often than not, that's what it's really signifying to us, isn't it? Okay. Um, now this one created a little bit of a discussion. Most of this was around, it depends how big the boat is and where you are and whether it's wind over tide and so on and so forth. So your friend owns a small power boat, is looking to set to sea in an ebb tide against a forceful southwesterly wind. What would you advise? Now, I think I popped into one of the breakup and said, this is my world all over. So think Bristol Channel, tide goes one way, tide goes the other way. If there's an ebb tide and you've got a southwesterly wind, forceful, we've potentially got five knots of tide in one direction and force for wind coming up in the other direction. What are you going to be advising your friend in their smallish powerboat? Just we, we, we should go to the pub. Go to the pub. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think that's the thing. Go to the pub, or if it's locked down and you can't go to the pub, then go home and watch a box set or something, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, go drink tea, whatever it happens to be. Absolutely. Um, and again, it's also about... One day a force four for me, a force four southwesterly might be okay to go out in if I'm on a flood tide. Yeah, if it, that that might be okay. But people understanding the difference of that wind over tide and how it's going to affect them, particularly maybe in some of the estuaries. So certainly here where we have a really short wave period and it's often quite difficult to pick your way through them. So yeah, wind over tide is really important because people will just look at the weather and perhaps ignore the tide and not really understand that it's going to get them bumpy over here or it's going to get particularly bumpy around headlands and so on. So um, here we had, other than the Met Office then, took that one out of you because you're all going to say the Met Office. We, what five sources of weather forecast would you be suggesting? Where would you go for your five sources of weather forecast? What do we come up with? We had apps, lots of apps. Yeah. Um, Navtex, BBC, <laughs> um, VHF Radio, Marina Office, and the internet. The internet, it's a great answer, isn't yeah. it? Post guard. Yeah, post yeah, absolutely. I can't tell you the amount of time you ask a question and students go, the internet, you know, yeah, yeah, okay, but where on the internet? The internet's quite a big place. Okay, so apps, yeah, uh, maritime safety information broadcast, uh, Coast Guard, Marina Offices, uh, BBC. Any other thoughts? Anyone get anything else on their list? We look out the window. Look out the window. Nice one, Devs. Yeah, look out the window. What is it doing? Yeah, certainly. What is it doing now? If I'm doing a quick trip, you know, black round the bay, what is it doing now? Does it look nice or not? Start off a 10, isn't it? Yeah. And um, there is another one, I think, either Alan or Ray. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I said newspaper. Um, I did a course a long, long time ago and it was advised to get the telegraph for five days beforehand because it had a synoptic chart and you could see the weather pattern changing. Okay. Um, it, it's it's a good answer. I wonder how many two people actually buy newspapers though. Mm. I think that's the this is how it's all it's all changing, isn't it? Because certainly back when I was doing yeah, for, for me from a where would you get the weather forecast, the answers were going to be Radio Four <laughs> for, for my shipping forecast, the Marina Office, or wherever I happened to be, uh, whether there was a, a Coast Guard station or, or whatever it happened to be. Um, the internet didn't really exist. The synoptic charts that had been printed somewhere. Uh, but I think, interesting, we talked about apps. How do we feel about weather apps? So particularly when we're teaching, because what do students tend to talk about with weather apps? They have varying degrees of accuracy. Um, so I would say it's an indicator of what's happening, but look mm -hmm. out the window. <laughs> yeah, because they're not always right. on wind. I think they tend to concentrate on wind strength, not in the other conditions. Okay. I would disagree with that. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I would always tell people check two or three, um, rather than just picking your favourite and, and assuming that's going to be right every time. That's yeah. yeah that, that's uh, a that's a great point. Sorry, Jeremy, you had a you had a point there. I, I disagree. I think your first place. In fact, I think this question would have been other than the internet. Name five sources of weather forecast because I have maybe six, seven weather apps on my phone um, and some are designed around sailing, some are designed around gardening. Um, and I would say that they're very accurate, especially if you compare them. And really the, the, the paper based or the ones in the marina office or the radio is just a backup of what might be updating on them. So I would yep. never negate them. I think they're, they're the most important source at present moment. Okay. 
Can I say a bit? Sorry, can I mention that app as well? I love apps. (laughs) (laughs) I totally agree with Jeremy that they're they're, they're great. And we talk about them and I talk about them a lot on the course. But I I know everyone's got their favourite apps, but just my own experience. I use Boaty. Some of you have heard of Boaty, I'm sure. And the reason I use Boaty is it's the same language as the printout in the marina office. And it's the same language um, as the Solent uh, radio forecast. So it, it's got a, a, a common theme going through it. And I just find it's really handy for that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that. Absolutely. I think for me, the most important thing with the weather apps is certainly, um, and it, it's kind of very much even at beginner levels. When I, if I'm teaching, say, Power Level 2, and, uh, and the students are coming, oh, I've got this weather app, and it's really cool because the animations do this, and the arrows do that, and the colours do this, and it's all amazing. I say, do you know where the information comes from? And they go, well, the app. I'm going, does it though? Or are some of the apps just taking feeds from elsewhere and making them pretty? So we think that the absolute, it's a really good point of more than one. Booty, yeah, great example of, of, of an app, but it's, an, you know, having a look at more than one, because then the students say to me, but there's two apps here that don't agree. How can that be? Which one is right? I and have that a lot. I, I teach a lot of deckies uh, that want to do the STA courses and become super yacht. Um, yeah. skippers they've all they're all young they've all got a mobile phone they're all loaded with apps and we have this very conversation and, and the way i describe it is saying it comes from stuff called grip data you don't need to worry what grip data is mm-hmm. but it depends how it's interpreted the software in the app and you know so you'll you'll get ones that will um give a, a different answer from the same data because it's how it's been interpreted. And my advice to them is, if they've got half a dozen apps, go for the one that gives the grottiest weather. <laughs> a bit like when you put your dot in a cocked hat for anchoring, yep. put yourself nearest the p- closest point of danger. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I normally show in, uh, in, for example, Windy or Winguru, where it actually shows the forecast in five different models within the same app. Yep. So you can actually see it right there in front of you side by side to demonstrate that they don't all read the same, but if four out of five read the same, then maybe you go for that one. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think what people don't always realize is that the data, the very original data source can be different. So you've got the European and you've got the American um, as the two main ones. And they either feed off one or the other. And people don't realize that, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, Andy, go on, you've got your, you've actually got your hand up rather than a virtual hand up. So go for it. One of the things I use to complement it is uh, is the rain radar app, where you can actually see the rain on the front coming through live. And I have it set up to give me 10 minutes warning. I actually get an alarm 10 okay. minutes before it's going to rain. Okie dokie. Uh, right, Debs, you've put your hand up. <laughs> um, one of the things that uh, I try to get through to them with apps is um, they can get led into this postcode accuracy. Um, where they think because it's on an electronic device and they put in their postcode, it's exactly that. And they don't, and it's that whole thing that it's, um, some of those forecasts could be for very big areas. And if they're saying it's for, it's, you know, postcode accuracy, it's a little bit of fudging. Yeah, no, absolutely. And one of the things I'll just bring up in a little while is about teaching using the forecasting funnel. Um, and actually using that to, to look. Uh, go for it, Ray. Yeah, um, Jeremy can probably liken the app to um, his profession. It's very difficult to get doctors to agree on everything, and it's very mm-hmm. difficult to get these weather apps to agree. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. Really, really good point. But interesting that we can have that much discussion about a simple question, I think. Go for it, Bob. I think you popped your hands up. Go for it. Yeah. It just worries me that you're all talking apps, 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 because I do a lot of offshore sailing. We've got to use a barometer and look out the cabin. And think, <laughs> my why my goodness, that, that will never catch on, Bob. <laughs> goodness me. Can't imagine teaching power level two students, use a barometer and look where you oh. look out the window. Good heavens, no. No, but it's a really good point. And I think for me, it's about what is the, the whole extreme of what you're looking at. So the apps are great. And I think there's some great, yeah, so some of the coastal sailing where you've got that um, ability to do it but um, even then when I look at playing a weather forecast a maritime safety information broadcast and actually saying to the students right can you write down what's important in this um, 
there's much scribbling going on. And I'm thinking, just write the important bits down, like how windy it's going to be. You don't need to write wind, <laughs> force, whatever. You just need to write the way that, what that, that's going to be. So I think that ability to understand that barometer, that ability to understand what that whole pressure system is, is going to do to you. Absolutely. OK, conscious that we could probably do that all day and just a little bit conscious of time. So um, this was a, this was another debate, I think. What's the minimum weather knowledge you need to set to sea for a quick trip around the bay? Crikey, who wants to start with this? Because there was quite a lot of debate on that one. Go for it, Julie. Okay. Um, basically, if it looks nice and flat and it's nice and sunny, go for it. If it looks bumpy and wet and horrible, don't. <laughs> OK, so quite, quite simple stuff. Yeah, let's not go. Let's not go out and get wet. Any other thoughts? Yeah, Sources of information. OK, um, what do you mean by that? Well, it, it, they need to know the best source of the information, going back to what we were talking about earlier on, mm -hmm. the, the local conditions. Because I think it's also about... Uh, I always said a few times, like looking out the window, I think we're starting to move away from the ability to look out of the window, aren't we? Because everybody's got their heads into a phone or or an iPad or whatever they've got a, a signal from, um, or they printed out things that they have brought with them, perhaps. So I think it is very much that whole, what what if your iPhone goes overboard? <laughs> what, you know, what are you going to do then if your entire reliance is just on what you've got on the screen in front of you and you're not really understanding it then where where else could you go for that information okie dokie so um a really simple quiz 15 questions that sort of cover the entire range of what we would be teaching across all of the schemes i would like to think i sort of uh, I, I hope that they would have um, covered all of them what I'm just going to cover then is what are the levels of knowledge that we must have so I talked earlier about must shoulds and cuts so what must we be teaching our students in order to meet the syllabus? What should we be teaching our students, but perhaps how can we get them to apply it? And then what could we be teaching the students? So I'll pop the screen share up. Um, I've split this into two. I've split it into the theory side and also the practical side. I think the practical side will be a little bit more of a discussion because there are some blurry boundaries, I think, between some of the courses, I accept that. Um, but when we look at the, let me pop the screen share on. I went and dug out um, all of my theory stuff and said, here you go, these are the actual levels of knowledge and how long you're supposed to spend teaching it, which is interesting. So when we're looking down at that essential navigation and seamanship, um, personally, I think it's a great course. I think the online course is a great course, particularly for those who are looking at becoming PPIs, who want to get a little bit more knowledge. Um, so a one hour of, of meteorology to cover sources of forecast and the terms used in the forecast and an idea of sea states. Now, there's no level of depth of knowledge, if you like, defined for that, whereas there is for the Dayscape Theory and further up for Costa for Yacht Master. Um, but I did have a look in the online course and it is still talking me through all of those terms. It is talking about different sea states. It is talking about, about both force. It's talking about direction of wind. It's talking about where you can go get it from in the same way that we just have, you know, the radio, the internet, the marina office and so on and so forth. And that's very much that essential navigation side of things. Then three hours of meteorology at day skipper level. OK, um, those who teach day skipper theory, do you really teach three hours? Just as a thought. Yeah. Do you teach more? <laughs> There's a few, it tends few to more. fall into different parts, so it's not always a concentrated Okay. Um, weather section so in some of the questions you're having to explain what the weather symptoms are that they're asking in the question so yes there'll be a bit of concentration but it will be spread out through the whole course in, in various forms okay no that's a, that's a good point what was interesting for me is when I actually went and looked at what's in the syllabus as opposed to perhaps what are in the questions what's in the syllabus at the front of the book it's sources of broadcast meteorological information Knowledge of terms for shipping forecast, including both at scale, their significance of small crafts, basic knowledge of highs and lows. And the highs, lows and fronts is an outline knowledge. So there's an interesting thought. What is the outline knowledge rather than a working knowledge of a depression and highs, lows and fronts? How are you how are we going to be explaining that? OK, so I think there's, it's an interesting one as to the two. Molly, go for it. On the thing you saying syllabus, we have has knowledge of, which I'm assuming is an outline knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then we have 
oh, I can't remember now, understands. Yep. And then we have can do or can put into practice. So I guess it's I guess it translates pretty pretty similarly. Yeah, um, it can it can do. There are two. So there's um a de in depth knowledge. So for the theory side, in depth knowledge, working knowledge, and outline knowledge. So there's still those three categories similar to how we would expect it on there, the practical side of it. But I think for me, it's interesting. The working knowledge sits more around the broadcast. It's around the Buffett scale. It's around some of the knowledge of terms. So if you say a working knowledge of the knowledge of terms used in the shipping forecast, where do you stop? What are they supposed to do at the end of that? Is it to be able to quote, you know, for those of you who remember the old Yacht Master Theory weather papers of having to learn every definition known to man so that you could recall it like that and pop it down on the paper and then think, I'd just have a like a laminated card on my boat. Why do I need to remember this? OK, so I think it's interesting. Where do you stop with that at day skipper level? I think the most I think the most important thing at day skipper is that they and under, if they they know where to get a forecast and they understand the conditions that they're likely to be going out in after they've seen the forecast. Yeah. And I think for me, it's very much that is that when they're reading the forecast and a variety of forecasts. So even if we're going to pop the initial waters forecast up, for example, but, you know, you guys know as well as I do that the weather around the country can be very different. So not just focusing on the area that you've got. What is it in some other areas? Because there will be other terms, other knowledge that comes in. But what are we really expecting them to know? How well, it's the what's in it for me? What's the so what for me, isn't it? If I read the forecast, what are the things? And, and, and I would always say, you know, when we're looking at sort of the day skipper level or the um, the power book two level, perhaps even the intermediate level, as soon as you've got a red line around that inshore waters, you should really be asking yourself, do I need to go to sea today? Now, it might be that you've got some local conditions where actually you've got some shelter and it doesn't matter that it's a force five, you know what I mean? But actually, my first thing should be to students to say, if you look at it, let's start with the should I go to sea today? Not I am going to sea today, what is going to happen to me? I think that's probably one of the most important things. Um, basic knowledge of highs, lows and fronts, then outline knowledge. How are we going to do outline knowledge of a weather system? Surely you know it or you don't, right? It's a general expectation rather than an in detail um, labeling. Yeah, although when you look in the book, it's actually got those weather systems there and they, they're supposed to be able to understand whether it's a convergent system, divergent system, whether the winds are going in or out, all that kind of stuff. So I think, yeah, for me, it's about how do we take it practically into the next stage, okay? And then everything else from a yacht master perspective starts to bring in some more of the things like the weather patterns, um, so what are the weather patterns associated with the various frontal systems? How can we interpret it? Um, land and sea breezes, that's interesting. Fog only starts to come in. And interestingly, at Yacht Master, it's only an outline knowledge of sea fog. I kind of thought you either understand for sea fog or you don't. I'm not sure. To me, it's a bit binary. You either get it or you don't, I suppose. Um, but they're still only working knowledge, which is really, really interesting when you look at all the other stuff that you're teaching in the theory courses, which comes up at in-depth knowledge. This is still only a working knowledge of it rather than an in-depth knowledge. And I think for me, it's one of the areas where I'm teaching that students find some of the most challenging, because if it's a whole new concept to them and whether to them is looking out the window, is my washing going to get wet, yes or no? Once they start to start looking at what are the implications of it, it can quickly become something that, um, and I think a few of you mentioned this in the, the quiz, uh, the, the, the forms that you filled in, when, when is enough enough? At, at what point do I stop on a day skipper and say, you can broadly understand wind direction you can broadly understand the what's that what impact that's going to have on sea state you're going to be walking away from this in theory moving into an intermediate power boot course perhaps or into a, a day skipper practical where it is going to matter that you can make these decisions yes you are still very much being monitored by an instructor and it's obviously their decisions about where you're going or where you're not going but actually it's much more about how you can apply it to are we going to have a good day out or are we going to have a really bumpy day out, you know, uh, where you have the luxury of going out somewhere and turning left or right. That's a that's a big thing for you know, we just go out into the channel. But if you have that, then that's great. Go for it, Ray. Yeah, um, I've um, over the years, I've done a few of the Yacht Master courses, theory courses as a student mm -hmm. um, when they had the old Met paper. Uh, and I've been doing the courses as an instructor with Bob Russell, um, where they do the 
new, well, I say newish scheme now, where it's all part of package planning. And my observation is that the people that go through courses now have far less knowledge of meteorology than the ones did before. And you can almost get through the Yacht Master Theory papers without, with hardly any knowledge of MET if you get good marks on the other papers or the other parts of the paper. Yeah, yeah we, no, absolutely. Go for it, Robert. Yeah, we, um, I was just, well, I mean, I work with Ray. So, um, yeah, we do a um, sort of 15 minutes every morning on a MET, um, certainly for the Yacht Master. And I do it for the day skipper. In fact, for, for all my dinghy sailing, we always start off with a weather brief and a tide brief, even though we're sailing in Bristol docks, we don't get the tide, but we do that. Um, so yeah, it's, um, and that really is good. The, the sort of 15 minutes at the beginning of each day, um, looking at the weather charts, uh, looking at what we're going to get, looking out the window, um, they build up the knowledge over the week um, of, of what that all means. Yeah, and I think it's a really, it's a really interesting. So um, my background said ex-military, um, coming from the RAF, we would always have had a weather brief at eight o'clock every morning before we'd go flying. Um, and it was always that. It's, it was the whole weather brief. What was the weather doing today? What's the weather likely to be tomorrow? What impact is it going to have? What are the restrictions it's giving us? And I think it's a really important thing, even when um, we used to have a board up in our training centre as well that we would write what the weather and the tides and so on were doing. So as students were just coming in for the day, we would be saying to them, have a look on the board before you come into the classroom. What do you understand from that? Is this good tides, bad tides, um, particularly here? What's the wind going to do? W would you make a decision to go afloat, say, this afternoon or this morning, you know, and get them to start thinking along those lines? So I think it, making it incumbent on them to start making some decisions, even if they get it wrong. Um, it's, it's what is important to them. So... Yeah. You know, dinghy sailing, you know, novice doing a stage one, stage two, you know, you want nice light winds for them. If you've got a stage four, they want they want a decent amount of wind because they don't enjoy it otherwise. So it's 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 sort of what do those conditions mean to you? When is it rough to you? Yeah. Um, yeah. Not, not necessarily it says it's rough in the forecast where actually that's rough for everybody. Yeah. It's what does it actually mean to you? It's very personal. I think it is. And I think it's also um, uh, the idea of wind and its effects on a boat. It's perhaps moving some more of the practical side of it. I certainly did some own boat tuition for a couple. Um, uh, and here's a lorry driver. Um, and they had a sort of a nine meter uh, motor, uh, motor boat. Um, and they had they say, said, I know that the tide's going to affect the boat, but the wind's not going to make any difference to my boat, Kath. I'm like, oh, OK. Nine meter Mary Fisher, I think you might find it will. Um, and he was completely, completely oblivious because in his lorry, he drives his lorry and it goes where he tells it to. And he thought he would drive his boat and it would absolutely go where it tells it to. And when we had a force five, six in the marina trying to do some slow speed handling, he just didn't understand why the boat was moving. Just couldn't get his head around it. So we think also that ability, I mean, I kept saying to him, well, it's the wind, well, but, but, but this is a heavy boat. I'm like, but you're floating. <laughs> <laughs> you know, come on, really, this is this is rocket science, you know, we're going to have to get this. So I think for me, it was really interesting to have a look at the fact that it was a working knowledge of it. Um, we're getting into uh, different types of um, sort of local weather, if you like, using a barometer as a forecasting aid. So I can't remember who it was. I think it was uh, Bob. I think you, you mentioned that one. That is part of the Coastal Skipper Yacht Master syllabus. So anyone coming out of that should be able to use that barometer as a forecasting aid. So how does this relate into the practical? Sorry, Jeremy, you've got a, a point you want to raise? Oh. Uh, uh, well, apart from uh, lots of apps for the barometer, but that's a different issue. <laughs> now, I mean, you've, what you talked about a lot, and I, I'd like to ask is, you talked about the significance uh, in a general term, significance of all this data which you're getting in, how does it affect you? How much do you need to teach the underlying theory of why these, why these situations change? Because that, I think, at the end of the day, gives lasting knowledge where, whereas you forget, you know, that picture, you forget what the significant, well, you might understand the significance, but you're not quite sure how to interpret the, the, the data you get. Yep. But if you're underlying, you really understand even the fundamentals that, you know, warm air is lighter, and that's why it all happens. Um, how much do you teach on that or feel we should teach on that? Because for me, that's more important than anything else, really. Yeah, 
Okay. Uh, hold that thought. Hopefully I'll come to that. Let me do the practical bits of how it is. Fingers crossed, and I'll come to that because I'm going to talk about the weather forecasting funnel and how we can use that to start big and, and, and bring some of the, the basic concepts in before we even go with. And that hopefully we'll cover all of the schemes. And I would say pretty much no matter what age you are. So Molly, I think even when you were talking about some of the, the littlies, then there might be some bits and pieces in here. OK. Um, so this is what the practical looks like then, okay? Um, I've gone for likely activities, I've gone for potential courses, I'm sure there will be things that you disagree with in here, but you had to draw the line somewhere on there, okay? So if we have beginner novice, then so that should say, um, the, the top title should say, um, so the more the, the day skipper and the coastal skipper, where does that fit into it? Um, so beginner, uh, intermediate and, and more advanced. We're really looking at obtaining forecasters of source of information and the significance. And this is what it's saying in some of the, the syllabuses. So looking up in the, I did have a look in the dinghy in the National Sailing Syllabus. So I did go and look in there as well as to what it is, um, which was the sailing level one and two. And for me, we're looking at if where people are going offshore, well, if they're going sort of less than three miles, so they're going to be within a bay, they're going to be within that site of land, that kind of thing, just how they can obtain it and the significance. And interesting, when you look at the day skipper side of it, it actually says record the weather forecast from a radio broadcast. That's it. That's really it for the day skipper practical. Um, <clears throat> and I'm thinking we probably do quite a lot more than that, don't we? We're probably looking at how we could actually use that weather to plan. But when you actually look in the book, that's what it's after. Um, and then for the, the coastal skipper yacht master theory, how does that feed into the practical side of it then? Into obviously sort of more advanced power boat. I'd like to think that my advanced power boat students have done yacht master, but many haven't but much more about that, the definition of terms, the local effects interpreting the forecast, and then actually using weather to plan a passage. Interestingly, up at that more higher end is the first time we really use weather to plan a passage. Um, whereas I would think quite a lot of us are probably bringing that down a little bit. I mean, I certainly would be talking about how we can use weather to plan a passage from a day skipper perspective. Um, whereas, um, you know, from a, an actual what's in the book, that, that's kind of what it says. Um, any thoughts on, on that? Bring you all back from a practical perspective. Just uh, perhaps on the dinghy scheme, what we actually have is a, a weather, a wind guidance uh, according to the different uh, courses that they're doing. Okay. So level one, level two is light winds, whereas seamanship skills and the others are moderate winds. Okay. So it actually formalizes it. Okay. Um, and I don't really think we have that in any of the other schemes, do we? Not that I'm really aware. We all have sensible winds that we wouldn't wouldn't go out in. But uh, any thoughts on that for bigger schemes? Go for it, Molly. Bigger schemes, just building on what Matt said. Um, for the centre centres I work at, you have um, you definitely have force caps as well, so you wouldn't take any beginners out in anything more than a four, mm -hmm. um, or even a four sometimes, um, uh, whether you're a DI or an SI. Yeah. Um, yeah, that that's just the the centre rule we have. Um, I I don't know if that's the case with day skipper um, people instructors or not. I don't know. Day, so those who've taken day skipper practicals out, what sort of weather have we been out in? Um, loads, loads of different ones. Yeah, and certainly on the sailing side, um, it will very much depend on where in the week we are. Okay. If it's day four and five and you have an understanding of capabilities, yeah. then you might push the envelope a little bit further. Mm -hmm. If it's day one, you keep it very cautious because you don't know what people, how people are going to react. So it, yeah. we don't have a hard and fast rule, but it will depend on um, the, where we are in the course, really. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, isn't it, about what people are used to. Um, um, and what isn't quite as scary anymore because they've sort of seen it and realised that they've survived it um, and that actually they had some fun doing it. So uh, I yeah. think as well, in the, on the sorry, on the day skipper courses, I teach quite a lot of them as well, in the Solent, when it, when it gets a bit windy, like over 30 knots, I don't know what everyone's threshold is, but, and I quite agree, it depends how experienced the crew is, it wouldn't be the first day, but a hell of a lot in the Solent to me, and I'm sure to the others, depends on what side of the, the, yeah. the Solent we are. You know, if it's blowing off, if blowing off the land, you, you can tend to push it quite a lot more um, than, than being the other side. So quite often we come out of Portsmouth Harbour and go straight over the Isle of Wight if it's from the southwest, and you you can um, you can take quite big winds then because it's flat, and that mm -hmm. seems to be the issue. That's it. 
I, I think I mean that's absolutely right. It's nothing to do with the wind. <laughs> no. it, it's only to do with the waves. Um, okay. And I've taken very novices out in big winds, but on flat estuary water. But as soon as you get, you know, from Hayden Bay through to um, I'm, I'm in South Sea, um, from Hayden Bay to so it's a different, completely different animal for the same wind. Very different. <laughs> go, go for it, Molly. When we're teaching children as well, we have, so I had, I had a shocking day a, f a few years ago and um, I had two people get hit by the boom and it was a nightmare and I was really upset and there wasn't any long-term injuries, it was all fine. And the SI debriefed me and said, actually, the wind, the sky changed colour and your children suddenly got a whole lot more nervous because it went a little bit grey, the sun went in, started spitting a bit. Yep. And yeah, the, your, your, your pupils suddenly realised they weren't as confident as they thought they were. And the, the wind, um, I realised, yeah, the wind speed didn't change. Nothing really changed. But the sky changed colour and that can make a whole lot of difference. I, I think it, it's, it's you know, vastly different if the sun's not shining anymore, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, big, big difference if the sun's not shining anymore. Okie dokie, I think that's been a really useful discussion. So hopefully that has given you more of an idea of actually what the schemes are supposed to be teaching, I'd like to say. So that's what the books say. Um, I know we all teach slightly different things. And um, what I would just want to do just for sort of the last 15 minutes or so is just have a look at some of the ways that I teach and um, to some of the slides that I use or some of the methods that I use. Um, I sat in on um, a free session that came out of the American Weather University. Um, and it was a particularly, well, a particularly great chap on the American Weather University. And they talked to me about the forecasting funnel. And I think if I just pop it up, and then you may well see what I mean. So I think, uh, Jeremy, you sort of mentioned the question of, you know, what, what do we teach? How do we teach it? Because we can teach, um, we can teach definitions to our heart's content. We can put slides up or we can have things on the wall. We can have charts and all sorts of things with all of those definitions in there. But what do I look at teaching all of my students? to different levels of information, but even when I'm teaching really, really basic stuff. So the forecasting funnel, um, as you can see on the slide there, talks about that hemispheric scale. So what is going on big picture around the world? Okay, what is that hemisphere type look? So I've put a screenshot up here. Let me just grab my annotate. Uh, there we go, bring these over onto this one. So we've got something like, um, I've gone for a deliberately big chart of passage weather as an example, so what is going on, or something that's quite big for um, from a windy chart as well. What is going on with the weather? Most of the things that we can look at now are animated and we can play them over a period of time. That obviously depends on what they are, but looking at that hemispheric scale. So does it look big and angry or does it look quite settled? Let's start with that. Then we're starting to move down from an idea of what our hemispheric scale is saying into what our synoptic scale is saying. So down more at our synoptic scale where we're getting that little bit more information perhaps about looking at our isobars, starting to bring in what the fronts are doing, what does that mean? Because then we're looking at, do are we gonna get wet? Question one, is it gonna rain? What is the wind going to do during the trip that we are going to be having? What is the effect of the wind on the sea state that it's going to be, okay? Then I start looking more at the meso scale, which is more down on the right-hand side here, where I've got my inshore waters, I've got my XC weathers, I've got things that I can see perhaps a little bit more locally, but also I can see more of a picture of what's going around the UK. And those that are showing me things, this is um, one from XC Weather, I think, you know, it is useful that the stronger winds are bigger red arrows, you know, because they are easy things to have a look at. And again, I'm trying to get the students to think about what does it mean, okay? We don't have to necessarily be able to quote how many knots of wind it is going to be, or how many meters per second or whatever, you know, scale you have got chosen. But what is it, is it going to be breezy, yes or no? Okay, if it's going to be breezy, what effect is that gonna have? Then when I come down to my more local scale, I'm selecting in on one of the areas on the inshore waters, or this one I put on the left hand side for you, here is an idea of this is our um, Avonmouth docks. They have a, um, a live weather stream, which I can also hear when the shipping is coming in and out of Avonmouth and they're talking to the VTS here as well. So I'm starting to look at what does it really mean today? So what did it say that it was going to do? 
what was, what, was, what was the wind direction that I was looking at? You know, some students looking at me go, well, they, they kind of understand that northerlies are cold, but sometimes they've never really understood that that means because they come from the north. So tide going to a direction, wind coming from a direction. And I'm saying to students, we know where the wind came from. We don't necessarily know where it's going to go to because there are lots of things. We've talked about convergence and divergence. We've talked about also the mountainous effects, all those kinds of things. We definitely know where the wind came from. And what I'll come to in a minute is the air masses that I would teach. So how do I start big, okay? Even at a day skipper level, I'm saying, let's start big. Let's look at what that big picture is and go for live data. Yeah, if you've got your, your you know, your classroom with a, a Wi-Fi connection or if you've got a, a, a iPad on board, actually go look at what that means. What does it mean temperature wise? What does it mean? You know, how angry is this weather? OK, um, I tend to teach using these weather models. This is how I split my sessions up. And um, this is, as I would say, my personal preference. It gives me the option then of going backwards and forwards between some. Um, I'll take you through the introduction to weather in a second. So I think that was really Jeremy's point as to where, where do we even start with this? Yes, I do about weather sources. And again, all of those things that you said, boaty, windy, and so on and so forth. Yeah, absolutely great apps. What the definitions are, um, what, how the pressure systems work. What is a pressure system? But I'm not really going to teach pressure systems until I've taught my introduction to weather, which is going to include global winds and a jet stream. We even hear people talking about the jet stream, where the jet stream is on the BBC weather forecast. So reasonably, people will understand what that jet stream is. I appreciate some of the more younger students might not. But would they be able to understand a big ribbon of air that is driving it? Yes. Have a lot of them watched Finding Nemo and understand the ocean currents. I think it's is in Finding Nemo when they go and jump on the back of all the, the, the turtles going on the Great Australia Current. Might they understand something like that? Yeah, absolutely. What does it mean? It's a big river. It's like a big ride, you know, where it's going. So it's a great big ride of air on which all of our weather systems are going to jump on. So talking in those terms starts to get people really understanding what those weather systems are going to be. Um, yes, synoptic charts. Um, where do synoptic charts fit now? Well, for me, it's about that forecasting, the ability to understand a geostrophic scale, what one of those is, and get your dividers out and start measuring. So understanding how much of that geostrophic scale you are putting in. Um, clouds, I think that was mentioned by a few people. Clouds, clouds just relatively simply, it's, it's a game of it's a game of snap, it's a game of matching things. Okay. I just need to learn some of the basics and then I need to learn what they mean. So the clouds are either nice clouds or they're gonna get me wet. Let's take it from there. Let's even start with those. Do they look angry? If they look angry, they're probably gonna spoil my day sailing. Because if they already look a bit grey and a bit angry and a bit billowy, then maybe that's not going to be so great for my sailing. So get people thinking in those terms. Again, with fog, huge difference, you know, fog. Some simple things, like I said earlier, something cold, something warm and wet. Without that, we can't have fog, can we? Something has to cool or heat. <clears throat> Some has to be moisture. If there's no moisture, we can't really have any fog. And then my winds and my local effects are my catabatic winds. They're my um, onshore breezes, offshore breezes, whether I've got anabatic, catabatic, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I'll pop some of my teaching tips on um, at the end. I'm not going to go through all these slides just in case you think, holy cow, Kath, it's like 20 to 10, it's 20 to 12 and lunch is on the way. I'm not obviously going to do it, but I'm happy to share some of them. Okay. So I start here. What are the four major elements of weather? So have a thing. If you had to define weather in four things, what would it be? Have a think. Four, four things make up all of the weather, whether it's fog, whether it's wind, whether it's whatever it is. What are the four main things for you that you would say for weather? Precipitation. Oh. So, yeah. one, so, sorry, so we've had one saying wind, one saying precipitation, okay? Temperature. Temperature? Heat. Anything else? Visibility. Sorry, Robert? Visibility. Okay, yeah, maybe. Air pressure. All right, air pressure. Okay, and this is where I start with it. So when you say to people, what is weather? Weather is temperature, okay? And we can go from everything from, is it warm? Is it cold? Are we expecting it to be warm? It's winter. It's supposed to be cold, right? It's not supposed to be warm in winter, okay? How do the temperatures vary? I start to look at it and say, 
do you students understand how the sun beats down on the earth and why it's warmer at the equator? Because it sticks out. Do you understand that there is a tilt on the world? And that's why we have the different seasons. That's why we have the different daylights and so on. And just start to understand that most people will get, they go on holiday to somewhere warmer, which for the majority of us, I think is south, right? That's, the, that's what most people are looking at. Yeah? If I wanna go and do some nice sailing, how many times do we get students saying, oh yeah, well, I'm gonna go and do my sailing in the med because it's warmer. Well, yeah, it is. Doesn't mean it's any better. But you know, you might have to wear less clothes. I suppose that's the that's the big the big bonus, isn't it? So I start with temperature. Then I talk about atmospheric pressure, air pressure. Okay, so what effect is gravity having? What about the air pressure here? Okay, how are the molecules in the air starting to contribute to the weight of the the, the pressure? Okay, people will tend to have heard of, and I appreciate Molly not necessarily the kids, but they will tend to have heard of high pressures and low pressures. Okay, what does that really mean? Where do we even start with that? And then I look at the wind, because when we're talking about things like sea state and so on and so forth, we're looking at it in terms of how windy it is. And then the last one is humidity, how much water vapor is in the air. And out of those four basic things, we can all, we can create all of the weather that we are talking about, whether it's divergence, convergence um, on the coast, whether it's a high pressure system, whether it's a low pressure system, it all relates back to these four major things. So I'm talking to the students, what do they already know about that? What, how, you know, how much do they already know? Have some of them perhaps been on holiday to warmer, more humid climes and understood it? Do they, do they get that the jungle is more humid? You know, do they understand those kinds of things? And if we can come up with those things, when we start then moving into warm air versus cold air, it starts to make a little bit more sense. So hot air balloon, how does a hot air balloon work? We add the heat into it, the molecules move further apart, the balloon expands and it rises. Simple. How many were talking about perhaps teaching kids? How many kids have stood and watched the bonfire and watched all the embers flying up? How did how did how did that happen? You know, they've got little, you know, they haven't got the rockets on them, have they? How are they rising? How is that starting to talk? So when we're talking about um talking about a uh, uh, sea breeze, if we had lit a bonfire over here, what would be happening to it? So start talking about a hot air versus cold air okay? and starting to bring in the fact that we have warmer air, less dense, cooler air, more dense. And again, I'm also thinking of trying to say warmer and cooler just means warmer than it was or cooler than it was. It doesn't necessarily mean warm or cold because we could be in winter where our warm sector is still cold. It's just slightly warmer than it was before. Okay. So I think getting students to really understand that for me is really important. And then when I start talking about high versus low pressure, I bring in something really simple. I think Molly, you mentioned it earlier about the idea that that hot air rises, creating that vacuum, cool air is replacing it, and we get that whole cycle going. I think the vast majority of people can tend to get that, but it's then when we start talking about how does that relate to high and low pressure, it, that seems to be where the students start to disconnect a little bit. Because up until that, they were kind of like, yeah, it just goes around in a circle, or maybe the earth spins a bit and it goes in a funny, you know, slightly funny circle. But what does that mean? So if it isn't pushing down as much, it's creating an area of low pressure. If it is pushing down a bit more, it's creating an area of high pressure. So that when we move on to something like with the simple sea breezes, I'll pop them all up, the simple sea breezes and land breezes, they're already thinking some way in those terms that you want them to be thinking about. But you'll notice here I haven't talked about um, any kind of wind strengths or anything like that. I'm just getting into some simple terms of what does it really mean and how is it going to affect me? OK, <laughs> any thoughts on um, that so far? Let me just come back out of the, the screen share for that. Any thoughts on that? And these are all things. These are all pictures. I'd like to say that I've created all these pictures myself. I haven't. These are all stolen off the big <laughs> internet. <laughs> I was really pleased that you brought temperature in as the first thing, because when I've been teaching weather, particularly at day skipper level, people say, well, the shipping foot, the yeah, forecast doesn't ever say anything about temperature. <laughs> Yet, as you know, you know, land people, weather, is it warm, is it raining, are the two <laughs> major things. Yeah. And, and, and the way you introduced the, act, the aspect of 
temperature there. I, that's one of my takeaways anyway, so nice. thank you. That's right, you're very welcome. I'd like there to be some takeaways. I would like I would like there to be some takeaways from the session. Okay. Um, bear with me. Let me just get the screen share back up. Um, now, some of you might think, God, global winds, that's a bit of a big subject, Cass. And I do go in for global winds. But what I find is that talking about global winds, like I said, the idea that there are some big ribbons of winds that are going around the world, okay? I don't really go into necessarily why or, you know, not necessarily how they got there, but just to know that there are some big ribbons of winds and the fact that we do have the Coriolis effect, you know? Most people understand, and particularly if I'm teaching at a, a day skipper level, perhaps, you know, we've already done the whole, why true north is different to magnetic north. So we've sort of understood some of that already. We've understood that rotation of the earth and just using some simple pictures. Um, a lot of people will have heard of people sailing across the Atlantic. Why do people sail across the Atlantic from um, like Tenerife and that kind of thing across? What, why? Why do they go there? Why do they go somewhere else? What's the, what, why do they choose that route? Come on, the sailors in you, there must be some Atlantic crossing arc sailors amongst you. Wind behind you. There we go. So we're already starting to think about, because it might be a slightly nicer point of sail and so on and so forth, so we can start bringing that in as well, okay? But just some simple graphics, and you'll see for me, there's not very much text on here, it's just all about graphics. For me, it's about the graphics and getting the students to focus on it so that I can then go into it and say, can you focus on this area? Uh, yes, Debs, go for it. Um, something I've used um, to help understand the Coriolis effect, it's something I made um, and it was a disc of paper with um, effectively a ruler going across it. And you have one person with a pen try and draw a line along the ruler as you turn the disc yep. and nice. it draws a curve on the paper on the disc. Okay. And they suddenly realise that although that is moving in a straight line because the earth's spinning you get it go and it shows that curve and you draw it from the north from the south from the equator it really brings it home very very quickly coriolis effect yeah no absolutely that's a that's a great tip thank you that's a really great tip that's a really great tip uh let me put me down there um i talk about jet streams i put some pictures up again i talk about them as big ribbons of wind for me, this is what is driving our weather systems. This is what is going to make our low pressure systems more angry. That's going to what's going to make our storms more miserable. That's going to what's going to stop us perhaps having a beautiful weekend sailing. So having this as sort of a conveyor belt and just showing them some pictures, how is that going to affect? For me, I can tend to describe it as um, back in the days when we all used to go on holidays and we used to walk through airports, quite a lot of the bigger airports. Now I've got those big travelators that you would stand on. OK, so if I'm standing on that travelator, I am already adding some energy to me. Now, if I'm a weather system, I'm going to be moving along that travelator and that is what is going to be powering these systems. So if the jet stream is over us, it's going to be bringing those weather systems. If it is slightly further to the north, it's going to be taking the systems away. If it's slightly further to the south, we might be on the top edge of the systems. So I start people thinking in those terms that this is almost a conveyor belt of weather systems that is going to come across the Atlantic. Because if we talk back to the slide previously on our global winds, we are looking at our predominant weather being southwesterlies. And if it is southwesterlies, how is that going to affect us? Well, that's going to bring all of this weather across. It's coming across a big ocean. I'll come into air masses in a minute, but it's coming across a big ocean. So this is a weather system that is moving itself over warmish water. It's feeding that machine. It's bringing that weather system over to us and it's charging it with more energy because it's on that big ribbon of air. And something like that, I suddenly start to see the lights go on behind some of my students. And they go, oh, I kind of get it now. That's where the weather comes from. Is that why our weather always comes in at the bottom left hand side of the weather chart? You know, when I'm watching the BBC weather, I'm like, you, yes, that's quite a lot of why it is. Yes, they're not always granted, but quite a lot of why. OK. Um, and for me, this is one of the most important things that I teach before I get into anything else. And I think even from a kid's perspective, you can bring this one in. And I had a thought about it from a dinghy because I had a I had in my mind a bunch of, you know, little ease. Um, how you could teach this. 
if we understand where the weather is coming from, we can start to make a decision on what it might do. Not necessarily what it will do, but what it might do. So if we have got this bunch of tropical maritime air, tropical, we go to the tropics on holiday, it's going to be warmer. If it's going to be warmer and it's coming across the ocean, it's going to be warmer, moist. So if it's warmer, moist air, it's not going to get here and not rain, really, is it? Because it's, it's full of moisture, so it's bound to have something. If it's coming across our continental air mass, then what is it coming across? And just showing it on that bigger chart of the, or the, that bigger weather map, if you like. Where is it coming from? It can't be that wet, really, because how could it be that wet? Because it's been coming across the land. And just talking about it in some really simple terms, same way with our Arctic maritime air. You know, people always say to me, well, how do you know it's going to snow? And I said, well, how can we make snow? They go, well, well, it just snows because that's just cold rain. I'm like, OK, so if it's cold rain, how did you make the rain cold? Where did you get the rain from in the first place? So if we're talking about weather systems coming up, that's our moist air bumping into something cold. That's probably where we're going to start getting our rain from, our snow from. <clears throat> Where's the, you know, polar maritime air again, bringing in some of that wet, colder air poem continental air and you can go into the level of detail on this to as much as you like um, for me I'm thinking even if I had some of the younger students you could even have like mats on the floor and say to them okay kids where are we going to get warm wet air from here's a, a, a largest picture if you like where are we going to get warm wet air from go and stand or point or whatever it is you pin the tail on the donkey where do you think that warm wet air is going to come from and why because it can't come across the land, it has to come across the sea. So starting students thinking along those lines really means to me that they start understanding the what of the weather before you start playing them with, oh, and by the way, there are some really complicated bits over here that you have to learn that are sea states and visibility and timings and so on and so forth. But at least at the end of an hour or so for me, they've got a picture of what that means, okay? Yes, we can have good weather, yes, we can have bad weather, but they've got that initial picture of what that means for me. Hopefully that will take me back up to the beginning. Okay, so if I go stop share. And any initial thoughts on that? Brilliant from my point of view. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, really, really well. helpful. That's all right, you're very welcome. Um, and do you think can. then, sorry, go on. Thank go on. you. Oh, no, that's all right. <laughs> Um, and even when I then start talking about things like, let me just pop something like this up, and you'll all say, this has got nothing to do with the sea. So hang on. So if you want to start talking about the Beaufort scale, what does that say to you? Yeah. It's nothing to do with the sea. I'm not showing you a whole load of pictures, because actually going to find 12 different pictures of sea states that fit into this is really quite tricky. What am I trying to get my students thinking about? You'll notice it's talking very much about flags. And a wise old man once way back when said to me, if that flag is completely out from that flagpole and not dropping at all, it is blowing a force five or more. If it's curling and it's dropping, it's probably not. And for me, that's a decision point. Mm -hmm. Force five is a big decision point for me, whether I'm going to go to sea or not, because force five is probably going to be bumpy. So am I really up for a bumpy day or do I really want to stay in? Like I say, that might be the decision if we're talking about some of the more extreme dinghy stuff. And like I said, I do, you know, I'm certainly not an expert on that. You might be sat there going, we're not going sailing until the flag's pretty much out from the flagpole. You know, I think, I think Matthew, you said earlier, it depends very much on what, what you're trying to teach. But for me, when do the trees move? Because there's no point me starting to teach weather by talking about sea state when the students haven't seen it because it doesn't mean anything to them. Why horses on the top? I can talk about white bits on the top of waves. Well, you might be lucky, they might have been on holiday, they might have been a breezy day, they might have looked out to sea. So for me, I'm talking to them, when do the big trees move? When do the small trees move? What's the decision that you're making walking from the car to your boat? Where you're in a sheltered marina saying, you can't even see the sea state yet. So, Sorry, go on, Jerry. I think you've got it. Was it Jerry? Oh, I didn't want to interrupt you. No, so, no, I was no. just, I mean, thank you very much. It's a very good talk. And um, um, on that, I noticed some of your slides were actually from A level kind of syllabuses and, and things like that. So we are teaching 
you know, that, that type of level and theory in particular. Um, but if one of your, and I'm sure Compass um, has really good talks, and most of what we were saying is how can the individual schools or person teach whether, but if a student comes to you and says, um, I want to go away and do a bit more reading about it around the background, um, I find the, anything from the RYA is so dry and really just revision notes and almost impossible to really get any more in-depth information on. I was just wondering whether what, what your experience is on the, the, the written um, uh, kind of textbook, for want of a better word, which a person can go away and discuss and absorb and think about. So they come back to the course the next day that much better. Yeah, I think for me, um, I'm not sure I've found a great weather textbook, if I'm honest. And I think to say to people, because there's so much of a differential between um, sort of the beginner, the intermediate and the advanced skippers and what they need to know, I'm really signposting them to more of the online material because it's in smaller bite size. I mean, the, you, you mentioned here about some of the kids stuff. Go look at GCSE bite size for weather. Why not? If it's good enough for 14 and 15 year olds, it's good enough for me. So go look at that. And um, one of the things that we do have is the, uh, the, the Met Office Weather Bites series. So if you go and look on the Met Office, um, if I just pop, there's a couple of ideas on here, bear with me. Um, something like these. Um, these are both videos that are on there. So if I want to teach weather fronts or get students to go away and read about weather fronts or understand weather fronts, there is no point me showing them a book. I can show them how the weather fronts work and so on and so forth. But actually, if they start to see it in action, so the weather bike series for me on the Met Office are really, really useful. Um, Met Erin, the Irish Weather Service, they do some very similar things. They often have talks on by some of their meteorologists as well. So if you want to go away and learn a bit more about it, for me, it's about some of the simplistic things. Going onto the Met Office and finding that there is, um, when we look at the synoptic charts, for example, there is a button to click that says interpreting synoptic charts, which takes you to another page and talks about it. Yeah. So I think for me, I've never found a really good weather book. I'm happy if other people have, but I've never really found a good weather book. Oh, oh. I do think some of the stuff online and some of the new programs online are really good. I can suggest one in that case. I didn't oh, know okay. Go on in. Have you heard of David Burr? Mm -hmm. B-U-R-G-H. Mm -hmm. He, he um, is an American. It's very much American weather. But yeah. His books on both the modern marine weather is quite heavy. I have to say it's quite heavy. And also his books on celestial navigation. If you want to sit down and really get the fundamentals out, yeah. um, I've yet to find anything which matches it. Some of it's too heavy, but it is very good. And I, and I think that's really the challenge for me is that when I'm even looking at day skipper level, let's say, um, I'm almost aiming day skipper level weather at GCSE type level weather, because that's really what we're asking. I mean, basic weather is basic weather, isn't it? And if I can find something that's more engaging for the students, you know, we've talked about things like windy and um, putting windy up and using the passage planning element now. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen that, you can go in and do the passage planning, you can move the slider up and down to see the weather. I might pop that up in a, in a second. Yeah, thanks for popping that in the, the chat, Jeremy. David Byrne, Modern Marine Weather. For me, it's about engaging them with moving pictures. And I think that's the big thing that has changed for me trying to, you know, back when I was studying for my Yacht Master Theory, looking at pictures and not really getting what it meant because it didn't move. So that's been a really big thing. So now we can look at watching the synoptic charts move. We can look at things like windy, where the arrows are already moving. So what the students are seeing is what directions the winds are going, and they're already starting to interpret that in their own heads. So I think that's really the key for me. But certainly, you know, don't underestimate the Met Office. There's huge, huge, huge amounts of weather in the Met Office. There is the American um, Weather University as well. That's a, a really good one. Um, but yeah, also has a celestial navigation one. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a good one for, for, for that. Um, and I think really, can they use what they have? I think we mentioned about going by the Telegraph, whatever it was, however many days before you go on your on your, your your journey and looking at what the synoptics, you know, time is moving on. And whilst there is still a place for that more traditional look at it, and I absolutely agree with the, looking at the barometer, I think for me, looking at those weather fronts, you know, saying to people, what is a weather front? Well, a weather front is an argument between warm and cold. That's why it's called a front. Armies march to the fronts frontogenesis that's what it's all about it's a fight between some warm and some cold 
somebody's going to win that. Yeah. And if that warm winds and pushes slightly further up, that's where we start to create that depression. If I'm talking about high pressure systems and low pressure systems, my high pressure systems, um, and some of you might have been on the weather, the weather lessons I've done, the high pressure systems to me are a big fat bully. I explain them as like, is it Jabba the Hutt out of Star Wars? That big fat character that's just going to sit and push everything out. When he sits down, it pushes everything out to the edges. So there's my high pressure system. That's why we're talking about convergent or divergent systems, okay? If I'm talking about a, a low pressure system, this is my angry toddler. This is my angry toddler. It's got really angry. Some big fight went on between warm and cold sectors, created those weather fronts. There's been that big battle. And so there's already a whole load of angry going on there, okay? There's already a whole load of anger going on there and it's coming across on that jet stream and it's sucking all that water up. It's just getting angrier. If it's that convergent system that's pushing it all up and pushing it out the top, it's like it's crying. So there will be water coming out of the top of it. So a whole jet stream full of angry toddlers that's coming right at you is really going to ruin your boating. Because just when you've got rid of one of them, or it's going to ruin your dinghy sailing, isn't it? You know, poor Molly's going to be sat there going, I want to get these kids out in the water. Not today. Angry toddlers in town. Not tomorrow. Angry toddlers still in town, you know, and getting people to understand it like that, because then and I say to them, if it's a low pressure system, they're not always that angry because sometimes your kids aren't, your toddlers aren't always that angry. Sometimes they're just having a bad day. So we get a fairly low, you know, near low pressure system that comes over and just rains a little bit. Or then we get some of those whopping great big pressure systems that have been spinning around in the Atlantic, working themselves up into an absolute frenzy, dragging all that warm moist air that they possibly could coming across the Atlantic being fired by a 200 mile an hour jet stream to where they come into some land, lift up and dump all that rain. Well, there's no surprise, is there, when you think about it in those terms? So I get people thinking about it in that term. Now, some people are uncomfortable talking to students in that way and would say that that's not very traditional. And I'm sure that there would be some purists out there who would be saying, oh my goodness, you can't describe it like that, Kath. But students get it. And once they get it, I can then start saying, so what about the wind direction? Where does that go? Let's look at a picture of it. If it is a convergent system, why is it sucking that in? If it is a divergent system, why is it pushing it out? And that's where I tend to take my weather systems through them. And how can I bring in things like visibility? I mentioned it earlier on. Go find something. If I'm teaching in a bay, can I, well, can I see the Isle of Wight? Yes or no? Can I see the end of the headland? Can I see this? What, what, what can I look at on my chart that my students could reasonably go, well, this is a mile away, this is two miles away, this is five miles away, and then we go look at it. Because just because it's a theory session doesn't mean it has to be inside, right? I mean, God forbid, I know the purists will go, oh my Lord, you teach students outside. Kath, I might do. We teach weather at Yachtmaster cloud spotting by standing outside and looking at them. <sighs> I mean, revolutionary, I know. I mean, the downside is then when they're driving home that night, they're so into their clouds and I have to say to them, please focus on the road and don't keep looking at the clouds. But what are they seeing and what can it mean? If you have got blue sky, can you be in a warm sector or are you in a cold sector? If I can see blue sky, really, what does that mean? If it's a big blanket like I've got now, I look at the window. If it's a big blanket that I look at right now, that's a big blanket of grey cloud, what does that mean? Where do I fit in that pressure system? Can I be on a weather front? No, because I've got no rain. So where must I be in that system? And get them thinking. And then if they can work it out for themselves rather than you telling them, I find that the students start to move on with it. And then once they've got that idea of wind direction and its impact on, on, the, on, the, on the sea state, then you can start talking about, OK, so what does it mean if I sail out of X? If I want to sail in the Bristol Channel and I've got stonking southwesterlies on an ebb tide, yeah, great for rough water handling. Not so great for me teaching, you know, power book level one to a couple of eight-year-olds. Yeah, because they'll probably just cry, I suspect. Yeah. But actually, and, and actually so will some of the adults, if, if, if I'm yeah. honest, it's not just Brilliant. the eight-year-olds. <laughs> it's not just the eight-year-olds. So starting to, start, starting to think about how does it affect me? What does it give me? because I can have a laminated card on board my boat with all of those definitions on. It never runs out of battery. You know, all that everyone says, you can't have it on your iPhone, it never runs out. I can have a laminated card. 
I can have something up on the screen, getting people to pace out sea state so that they understand that 14 meters is quite a long way if you want to talk about phenomenal waves. You know, actually drawing the picture. I think I have a, there is me, see if I can find one of the, the pictures to show. Could be just. But, but some of it is more about, for me, how students learn and what really twigs it for them so that I see in their faces that they are getting it. I'm just trying to find my seed state, bear with me. There we go. Uh, if I pop something like this up, okay. So yes, it's a really wordy slide, it is. But actually what I've done on the right hand side there is said, look how less interested we are, how much bigger those boundaries become, how much bigger those different things become, the further up we go. So actually, yeah, we've got lots going on down here for calm, smooth, slight, and moderate. I think it came back to the question earlier, you know, people say moderate can be a bit uncomfortable. Actually, then when we move up into rough, I mean, we're already up to four meters. After that, it's just damn bumpy, isn't it? Really? So what's the point in me saying to students, can you tell me how high high sea state would be in meters? Really? I'd like to know that they could tell the difference between moderate and rough. I'd like to know they can make their decision points at force four or force eight, you know, force five or force eight kind of thing. Force five, really do we go boating? Force eight, definitely go to the pub. Okay. So they're the kinds of sort of visual clues that I would be using in order to say, yeah, you can have all of that. So I can appeal to the theorists who wants to go read the books, who wants to have a look at it, who wants to see what it's written on the slide, but actually what does that look like from a picture? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just conscious of the time. I could talk about weather all day, but I have to do it again at two o'clock for the other mob, okay? But um, I would say any, um, any questions that you want to put to me. Thank you very much. Thank well, you. That's not a question, that's a statement, but there we go. Prof, <laughs> go for it, you put your hand up. <laughs> oh, just a thumbs up. <laughs> Sorry, I was just saying thank you, that was all. That's all right, yeah. okay, thank you. Um, I, let's say. Sure. Can I just say thank you? Nikki and Steve have got problems with their internet today. So can I say thank you from Nikki and Dimmer and Chichester Marine Training? Because I think you and them are doing a fantastic job with all these seminars, but it's been really interesting for all of us today. We'll all take something away. So thank That's you very much. Great. It's been really helpful. Thank you. OK, you. we've got a couple of sessions that are already online. So I did some basic teaching in lockdown, uh, lockdown one and lockdown two. I did some free sessions. I think some of you might have popped on to some of those free sessions on a whole range of topics. But um, there are two on online weather that on weather. Sorry, there's met one and met two. So basic introduction, some of what I've talked about, which is a 40 minute session where I'm sort of teaching it online. That's on our YouTube channel, on our training tips. And there's one about introducing weather fronts as well. So if you want to perhaps brush up on your system or get some ideas about how you could teach it, it's also perhaps worth, worth about that. Deb, yes, you've got your hand up. Um, well, thank you, Kath. It's been really useful. Um, just a couple of resources that people might want to look yeah. at. Um, something that I found, um, there's a really good, and the first one's for free, on Future Learn on meteorology, which has some really good visual things that you can do. Um, it taught me how to make a cloud in a bottle, which is always quite a fun thing to do in a classroom. Um, so Future Learn, their meteorology thing is really worth the time to go through. And also the Met Office is a great source of their fact sheets and, and videos and things. Um, it's really underutilized, I think, by a lot of us, not necessarily from the students, but maybe for us as instructors for background knowledge so I to, do, to share that with, with everyone. Yeah, no, absolutely. I totally agree. The other one I was just going to try and pull up for you, bear with me, is if I can find the right one. I've got so, I had so many windows open that I wasn't sure which ones I was going for. Um, we put a knowledge base onto our website because what we found was that we had quite a lot of students who were then coming in. Um, and we tend to teach some of our courses where we teach in um, sort of over two weekends. So perhaps we do a day skipper where we do three days, one weekend, and then they have some time off and, and two days another weekend so they can consolidate it a little bit more. Um, and if I can find the right screen share, bear with me. Um, we started to put bits and pieces up onto our website. So we had a knowledge base of various different things. And if I look at the weather training tips, hopefully that opens up there. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I've got 
sort of types of clouds, clouds, how they form, what do they mean? Uh, if I even go into the types of clouds, I think if I click on the read more, if it opens up, there's a little bit in there. Hopefully you guys can see this, right? Cloud pictures, yeah, fab. Okay, a little bit about some fancy clouds. You know, if you want to go and be fancy and show that you know something, lenticular clouds that look like spaceships, that's got to be a good one for the kids, huh? You know, when they see a, a spaceship. Um, so just some pictures like this. Yeah, the UCAR resources, I think that might be similar to what you were, you were just mentioning there, um, Debs, as well. And cloud activities, making your own cloud. There's all sorts of stuff that you can do. But again, thinking about some really simple pictures or even getting something printed to go on the center wall. Because if I'm gonna have something like this, this tells me everything I need to know about clouds, this one picture. And then I can talk about it. I've either got fluffy clouds or flat clouds or the ice crystal type clouds. And there we are, that's it. Really keep it really simple. So something as simple as that and some of those resources, yeah, absolutely. Some, and some of the kids' resources are great. Particularly now, I mean, I dread to think with um, as much as we have with uh, homeschooling going on and, and what's going on there, there might be all, all manner of weather experiments that you can you can do. You know, two different coloured liquids, one hot, one cold, sticking it into a um, you know a big square sort of goldfish tub and seeing how weather fronts form. That's a, that's another good one. So you've got some food colouring in some warm water, so that's that's quite a good one. Okay, okay. Um, just conscious of time, like I say, thank you very much for listening. Um, love to have any feedback that you guys might have had. Hopefully you've learned something. Hopefully you've enjoyed the session. Um, I just need to go have some lunch, take a deep breath and do it all again at two o'clock. So a big, big um, thanks, Kath. I really, really you. enjoyed your Sorry, um, simple yeah. teaching style. It's really good. And I'm going to go and have a look on, I'm going to go and have a look on YouTube. Yeah, we're going to have a look on YouTube. And like I said, high pressure systems, really, really angry. Uh, look, uh, low pressure systems, really, really angry toddlers. High pressure systems, jab of the hook, big fat guy, pushing it all out. It wor works for me. <laughs> there you go. And suddenly students go, oh, is it that simple? I'm like, well, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's all there is. There's a whole load of like atmospherics and physics and all sorts of other stuff that goes with it. But you don't need to know about that. You just need to know what it's going to do. Alrighty. So thank you very much for listening, everybody. Um, like I say, I hope you've enjoyed it. Any feedback would be absolutely welcome. I will stop the recording now. Well, thanks again.